and you folks were having a little bit of trouble. Do you think you could do what this group did? Okay, well, he's gonna try to help them to really work together better. But he's giving them what is called wait time. Because a while ago, uh, somebody did some research about teachers' questions. Somebody said teachers never ask questions. And a lot of teachers said, no, we ask questions. So somebody got a lot of money to do some research about how many questions teacher, teachers ask in a standard classroom. I thought, gee, I could spend that money on something much, much more important than tallying up how many questions teachers ask. But the results were startling, actually, because this woman, her name was Mary Bud Rowe, she researched 20,000 teachers, okay? It took her years to do it, and she tallied up, and she said, well, most teachers, 98% of the teachers, ask questions. They ask at least three or four questions every 15 or 20 minutes. She said, but what happens? They wait two to five seconds and then they answer their own questions. <laughs> and she said, you know, teachers should really stop and give the kids a chance to respond. <coughs> give them some wait time. And that's now filtered down as one of the standard practices in classrooms that focus on time. Give them time to think. <coughs> Let them respond. Now, I've worked with some teachers who just can't do that. You know, they... You know, they set up groups, they like this stuff, but they just can't, they, they start talking to the kids and they say, well, don't forget, you should, you know, make sure you write down this and this and this and this, you know. And so when I talk to them, I say, I notice, you know, you talk to the students and they stop working to talk to you. Okay, you notice that? Oh, yeah. And, you know, do you think it was effective? She said, well, I, she said, if those students were never gonna say those things. I had to tell them. To say. And I said, how do you know that? Why don't you give them a chance and see what happens? Maybe you'll be surprised, maybe not, okay? So, now, how do they do it? What do they do in groups and how does that connect with thinking? Do they just think, okay? Well, no. And this is a great innovation. This, actually, this idea came from a teacher and a group of students in a Florida classroom in the United States. And I remember one night, as I had been working on TBL, and I had, you know, we worked with teachers, et cetera, and they, in groups, the students talked about, they tried to answer the questions on the thinking strategy, and they and tried to do it in an organized way. And they were in a little bit of trouble because they kept wandering around. And I then got a telephone call from a teacher, actually this teacher in Florida, and said, can I come up to Boston and show you some things that we developed in our classroom? And I said, where are they? And she told me. And I said, yes, come on up and let's take a look. <coughs> well, what are they? They're not the list of questions. That's already taken care of. But rather, graphic organizers is a simple one. Okay, a T-bar diagram, the students are thinking, let's give them a place to write down what they're thinking. So they can write down their thoughts, go back <coughs> tomorrow, reflect, you know, did I write that? Maybe I wanna change my mind, it's okay. And other students can see what's written, etc. Now this is a simple one, a T-bar diagram. This is energy. Okay, so we're gonna go back to that. They've already developed the strategy. The questions are gonna ask and answer. They get reflected. Now, they've talked about why we have to really figure out the best energy source. They realize there's air pollution, okay, global warming, and there's a danger that fossil fuels will run out, and we'll be stuck with our energy, so we better figure out what we're gonna do. And so they're on options and they're working in groups, and each group is writing on a graphic organizer. Now, <coughs> how do they do that? If you want a group to work together, 
you don't want to give each student a graphic organizer and they do their own and they never talk together. So you have to come up with some way to help them to communicate together. And one of the ways, standard ways now, is that students have certain roles in these groups. And there's a recorder who listens to and records what the other students are telling them so that they get a, you know, a sense of what the group has come up with. And there's somebody who's, who fosters discussion in the group. And there's a reporter who reports to the class, etc. So that's one sort of technique that's used in the group work. But anyhow, the objective is to get their thoughts down on paper. Now, some folks have done some work later on on thinking, they call that making the thinking visible. Okay? But whatever you call it, okay, the students are making explicit what their thoughts are, and they're using writing. Good. Okay, so here's an example. This represents the class, the different groups. The teacher says, what are, what are some of your options? What are some of your options? And writes them on a big graphic organizer in front of the room. And that focuses the students. These are wonderful tools. Okay, so what do they have? Nuclear, solar, okay, uh, coal, oil, Okay, what's this? Thunder. Light thunder, lightning. not thunder, lightning. but lightning. Okay, now, did anybody ever say we can get energy from lightning? But it seems, I mean, man, lightning is electrical energy. Okay. Now, I don't know, I mean, when I was a kid, I learned something that all American students learned, that there was a guy named Benjamin Franklin Okay, during the Revolutionary War period in America. And he was also a scientist. And one night, there was a thunderstorm and there was lightning, and he went out and he flew a kite. But he put a key at the end of the kite string, and there were sparks. And he said, oh, I wonder what that is. Okay, well, of course, he didn't have the knowledge to be able to put all that together and say, hey, we can run our iPhones with this stuff. No. <coughs> but lightning, and that's what this student remembered. He remembered Benjamin Franklin and said, well, maybe we can harness energy from lightning. Okay, maybe we can, maybe we can't, but it's an option. And we get a lot of them, okay, including human power. Now, what does that mean? How can human beings produce electricity? Of course, one student said, well, my mother and father argued. There's a lot of electricity, okay? But no. <laughs> the students who came up with this idea said, imagine a law is passed on this planet, the planet Earth, that requires that every human being get on a treadmill and push it around as fast as you can for one hour each day. He said, there are billions of people. Maybe that'll give us all the electricity we need. Maybe it won't, but that's, we should think about that. Okay. So the students are actually, they're prompted to try to come up with some creative ideas. But now they have a list of what? Options. Where do they go from there? What do they need to think about to decide what the best option is? Should they close their eyes, go over to the list, and point to one and say, that one? No. What do you, in the thinking strategy for decision making, what's the next step? Think about the what? Think about the consequences. If we're going to rely on, you know, windmills, what would the consequences be? Compared to consequences <coughs> if we use solar panels. Compared to sticking with petroleum. Do windmills pollute the atmosphere? Well, the teacher said, what is it that we'd want to find out about an energy source that will help us to figure out whether it's a good one? So this teacher wanted a list of factors to consider. And I'll show you what they came up with. But first, think about it. What's one thing you'd want to consider 
about an energy source if you were trying to decide that it was a good one for, you know, Astorius or for this region? What's one thing you'd want to find out about it? Anybody? Efficiency. Is that what you meant? Okay. Does it produce regular electricity? Okay. Is it efficient? What's something else you'd want to find out? Okay. The cost, of course. You don't want your electric bills to go up. Maybe the cost is so low that it'll lower your bills. So that's important. So that's what these students do. Okay. And I'll show you what they came up with. They came up with a list like this. It includes polluting the atmosphere. Is there any pollution? What's the cost to produce these things? And what will the cost be to consumers? Now, do you know that? We don't know that. But we're going to try to find out. Okay. Solar panels. What's the cost of a solar panel? Anybody know? Well, we have 200 people in this room and nobody knows the cost of a solar panel. How can you find out? Because now we're going to transform this and these students came up with a matrix to use as the organizer and we will put the factors across the top, the options down the side. Wonderful. And then... In each of these boxes, we have to get information. We have to get information about cost and put it in. So here, what would you put in here? Solar panel and what? Cost. So how much does a solar panel cost? And the students, you don't want, you're not, you're not going to accept from the students, I don't know. Because if your students say, I don't know, you're going to say, how can you find out? How can you find out how much a solar panel costs? Okay, you with the nice sort of reddish t-shirt. Okay, no, you. Yeah, how can you find out how much a solar panel costs? For example, I have to Google. You can go to Google. You can say how much is a solar panel. Suppose you forgot your laptop and you don't have access to Google. How could you find out? Think. Oh, you might go around and if you see somebody who has a solar panel on their roof, you can knock on the door and say, hey, how much did that cost? Okay. Well, listen, you can figure that out and that's what this teacher wants the students to do. This teacher wants the students now to use what they've come up with to develop a research plan, getting information. And it's not complicated research. How much does a solar panel cost? Okay, how can you do it? Google, if you don't have Google, look around and find somebody. If you can't do that, there's nobody who has one, what do you do? Maybe you can go to your telephone book and look up solar panels and you can call somebody. Okay, maybe you know an expert on solar energy who works at the university. You can call him up on your cell phone. Okay, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take two days now, and each group is going to work on a different energy source, and you're going to have to get information in all these categories. So maybe you're going to work, we're going to work on wind, and you're going to have to find out, answer these questions. And you've got two days to do it. And then we're going to come back, report, and we'll put them all together so we can compare these different energy sources. Now, I thought, this is, they're, not, they're never gonna do that. Two days, they're gonna have to get all this information, okay? But I was completely, thoroughly wrong. I was amazed. And I realized these students now were really motivated. They were into it. This is their option. They're going to try to figure out whether this is a good one. Okay. This one of these teachers who was doing this lesson said to me, she saw some of her students, she was at a bookstore buying some thrillers, 
one night, and she saw some of her students in the bookstore. And they were at the science, in the science section. And she watched them, they didn't see her, but she watched them as they bought the books on their energy source, on solar energy, to try to get information. So I said to her, so what? She said, these students have never opened a book all year. Okay, I thought, okay, <laughs> good point. Okay, now, they collect information, talk together, pretty cool, and they enter. Now, they don't just enter information. They decide, does it count in favor or against the option? Is it a good or bad consequence? If it's not good, you put a minus. If it's good, you put a plus. And how important is it? Maybe it's really much, much more important than the others. Then we'll put some stars here and give these more weight. And then let's put them all together. And what do we get? Now, you can't read this, and I couldn't when I went into the classroom. And it wasn't just because this is in Spanish. Okay, it was in English, but it, the teacher had a big chart, and the students had entered all of these. And now you're going to compare them as an individual, and you're going to decide what you think the best one is. And you're not just going to close your eyes and pick one. And when you decide, you need to be prepared to explain why. Why do you think this is the best one? Okay? So, that's instructions from the teacher. And the students don't always agree. Now, what happens if you don't agree about something? Well, usually you say, well, I have my opinion. <coughs> You've got your opinion. Too bad. But no, it's not acceptable. I'm going to ask, the teacher said, that if there are two students who disagree, we put them together in pairs and talk together and that they have an open mind. That they say to themselves, well, I want to hear what my partner has to say about the source they chose because maybe they discovered something that I missed. And if I take it into account, maybe I'm going to change my mind. And it's okay to change your mind. That's the way we operate when we're trying to be reasonable and we're thinking through what to do. So let's get the students to practice that. And I thought, that's fantastic. You know, start students doing this when they're young, and this is going to be a kind of habit of respecting others and the views of others. Fantastic. But that's not all. Because now you've decided. I know some of you have changed your mind. We sorted that out in class. I asked who changed your mind and why. But now you're going to write something. And you're going to write to the government. And you're going to write and recommend your energy source. And when you do it, you need to explain why it's better than the other option. And why you think this is the best one. Okay. Now, students, a lot of students don't like to write. But these students were highly motivated and they figured out they need to go to their graphic organizer to get information that they put in their writing. So what's on the graphic organizers becomes a kind of free writing wonderful. And there's a structure. They explain what their, the best option is, and then they go one by one and they say, well, let's compare it to this one. It's better than this one. It's better than this one. That's why I think it's the best one. It's very organized. So they have a structure that they worked out in the classroom. And there's a piece of writing. Two pages. Now, I could ask you to get up and read it but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but now, to me, the, the, that this is not necessary when you work with decision making, but if you're concerned about student writing, this potential is here. And if students are really involved in this, you're going to have a high motivation level, and you're going to get good writing. Okay? 
I looked for and I couldn't find a, a picture of a woman from a university in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, who teaches dentistry to girls. Interesting. Okay, because we have a different image of women in Saudi Arabia. But she was in a group that I was working with at that, that <coughs> university in Jeddah, and we were working on decision making. I showed them all of this, okay? And I said, go back to your students and do something similar. And she came to me and she said, she said, I, it's, this is wonderful. I could never do it with my students. So I said to her, why? She said, they never say anything in class. So I said, well, let's see. So I went and I visited her class and I saw her, she, they, she had 80 students who were learning to be a dentist, dentists. <coughs> and they were sitting around tables and they were talking to each other. But this teacher came in, and the minute she came in, she started telling them about diseases of the gums. A little bit kind of gory, and I didn't really like it very much, but nonetheless. So she showed slides, she said, this is what Ron disease looks like, and this is what Ron disease looks like. And she went on and on, and then the class ended, and she closed her, you know, her projector, and she walked out. She said, see you next time. And none of the kids, none of the students said a thing to her, but they talked together. So I, so I had arranged, I was gonna go and visit her and talk about her classroom. And uh, so I did, I, and I went in and I said, you know, I said, well, I sat in that class, and she said, see, they don't never say anything. So I said, well, I noticed that. I said, what were you doing, you know, in the class, and she said, well, I was telling them about diseases, you know, about the gums. And, and I said to her, well, what are your rules about interruption? Students interrupting you while you're talking. She said, oh, we don't do that. <laughs> so, so I said, well, if you want to get somebody to say something, what do you usually do? And she, she said, oh. She said, I could have asked them some questions. She never did ask one question. So I said to her, why don't you try that out next time? Okay. And unfortunately, the next day, I had to get on an airplane to fly back to the United States and do other things. And I didn't go back there for another month. And when I went back, I wanted to talk to her. And it was on, it was, it was on their weekend, which is our different days from in the US. But I found her office, I called her up, and I said, can I come and visit you? I want to hear about your lesson. She said, yes, come. So I walked up to her office, and I knocked on the door. She opened the door with a big smile on her face. So I said, you look pretty happy. You know what she said to me? She said, I will never, ever teach that old way again. And I said, what do you mean? She said, look at this. And she took me into her office, and she showed me a letter from a student to a patient saying, well, Mrs. Rumra, we've diagnosed your problem. You have Publub's disease of the gums. And there are some remedies. You have five options. You can do this, or this, or this, or this. Okay, and I'll make a recommendation, but I want to explain to you why. And, this, and the letter went on, well, the first option is so-and-so. You compare it to the second option, Blah, blah, blah. But then compared to the third option. And then at the end, he said, and that's what my recommendation is. And that's why, because it's the best option of all of them. Okay. And I thought, well, and that's a big difference from what I saw compared to what she was doing. So I said to her, I said, well, that's one student. Maybe that's the bright student in your classroom and the others don't do anything. She said, no, look at this. And she showed me a stack of letters from all of the students to patients doing the same thing. And just like this one. And I thought, hey, you know, now I know why she will never teach the same way again. And she keeps corresponding with me and telling me about things that she's doing. Okay. Now, that's university, but that's what we saw here.
So, okay, now, this was now, uh, you know, I wanted to give you an example of from the start when the teacher introduces the thinking strategy, works with the students to develop it, they make it explicit, they try to follow it, they work in groups, they do some reading about things, okay, they use graphic organizers, they report to each other. If one group reports something that your group didn't come up with, we're sharing, it's perfectly okay for you to add it to your work and we're gonna work together as a class and we'll try to come up with conclusions. If we disagree, we'll work together and talk about them and we'll try to resolve them, but maybe not, okay? But then we're gonna write, okay? Wow, how different from a classroom where the teacher gets up there and says, okay, I'm gonna tell you about the best energy source for our country. Okay, now, choosing. This is a kindergarten classroom, five-year-old kids in a school in Lima, Peru, as Arena School, it's called, and they're learning like, you know, a lot of these kids learn again about food. Now, what has the teacher done? Well, they're gonna use that thinking strategy, and the teacher has discussed it with them, and now she gives each group a paper plate and then some cardboard models of different foods, a, a hot dog, donut, piece of fruit, some vegetables, and they have to put them on the plate to make a meal. What's the meal, what meal you want? And they do. And she then posts them as options. And they're gonna to try to figure out what the best one would be for them. And they're gonna do that by thinking, selecting one and thinking about it. What are the pros and cons? Then they select another and then they compare them. So that's what she does. This one has one, two, three, five pros, one con. So strong taste for that one, but let's compare it to the others. Okay, great. And the students come to a conclusion. Now, they're not gonna write about it, but wait till they get to third grade and they start doing some real good writing. Then you can transition them into that. Okay, and then of course, there's Horton. How are we gonna do that? Well, they use a different, a more simplified graphic here. Options, pros and cons. Is it a good one? And they have to explain why. And they can't write. So the teacher has this up on the board and they do it orally and the teacher writes the options. Now, can you read these? Read these on the side. Run away without the egg, run away with the egg. Talk to the hunters and explain to them what you're doing and ask them to go away. Fight the hunters. Make yourself look like a tree. Camouflage. Okay, I mean, these kids came up with a bunch of interesting options. Okay, and then the teacher says, let's pick one. Run away without the egg. Is that a good one? Is that a good thing? Let's think about the pros and cons. Okay, and they do. Well, Horton will escape, save his life, but the egg will die, Maisie will be unhappy, you broke your promise. Is this a good thing to do? No, they decide it's not a good thing to do because you promised, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%, okay? So, not a good thing to do. So what's the best thing to do? Well, I'm gonna leave that for you folks to try to figure out, okay? Tonight, you're gonna wake up at 3 a.m. and say, ah, I know what Horton's are doing. Okay. But you get the idea, all right? Now, comparing and contrasting. Okay, and good, we're running. We're okay, time on. Got about 10 more minutes. Okay, so here's the graphic organizer now. It's not a Venn diagram. Here are the two things, similarities, put the differences here, and what kind of difference. So you're gonna think about the differences. If you have more than four differences, you write them out here, okay, and then You'll cross out the ones that aren't important. You're doing this all in your groups. And then what are your big ideas? 
okay? And you write them down. And the big ideas may be, you know, say in social studies, freedom, equality. They may be, you know, in science and health. They may be, you know, nutrition, okay? And maybe safety, things like that. And you want the students to extract those concepts. And then what conclusion are you gonna to come to? And use those words in your conclusion. Okay. Now, the conclusions these kids come to are conclusions that, in a sense, are contained in the similarities and differences already, but you never, you can never, you <coughs> never know it unless they extract the conclusion. And then they're learning something. Okay. So here are some students. This is a classroom in Valencia, in which they're, in their textbook, they have those diagrams of plant cells and animal cells. And there is a graphic organizer. You can't read this, but this is an interesting one because one group of students, okay, said, said, well, we discovered something. What? When they gave their report to the class. We discovered that, that animal cells have very rigid walls and plant cells have flexible walls. And we wondered why, and we thought, well, maybe Plant cells, they're rigid because you can stack them one on the other so plants can get close to the sun. Whereas animal cells, animals have to move around to get food. So they need flexible walls. So these kids have never realized that there's so much in them on the other cells, but that's important. Now that's an incredible conclusion, but it's only a theory that these kids are coming up with. And the teacher said, why don't you go tonight, go to the internet, see what other people say. Maybe they say the same thing. If they do, you know, take that into account. If not, see if you have to adjust your ideas, or maybe you think they're wrong. Great activity. And these, those kids did that. In that group, they went back. One of the students stayed up all night trying to find things on the internet. And they came back and they said, well, most people seem to agree with us. Okay, I thought, hey, wonderful. Okay, not that they agree with. So, and, but there's some differences, and they explained them, et cetera. Now, I thought that was absolutely wonderful. This is their conclusion, and you can read that. Now, imagine just listing similarities and differences. Never in a million years would this conclusion occur to the students who are just telling you what the similarities and differences are. So there's, to me, there's tremendous power in this strategy for skillful comparing and contrasting because you do it all the time and you try to come up with conclusions and if you just list similarities and differences, you never do. Here is, these are the kids who did the, um, fast foods in the Mediterranean diet. And they're all smiling, not because they came up with a great conclusion, but because they noticed me taking the photo. Okay. <laughs> but anyhow, what is their conclusion? Well, it's simpler, these are younger kids, but basically they end up saying, well, you know, turns out that a lot of things we really like to eat aren't very good for us, okay? And that's a conclusion. Now a teacher can say, take that and use that as a topic sentence in a piece of writing and go back to your similarities and differences and explain why. Okay, great way to do expository writing. And again, what's on their graphic organizers is free writing. These are students with totalitarianism and democracy and the teacher didn't say to compare totalitarianism and democracy, but gave them descriptions of two countries those words were never used. They compared and contrasted, and they had to come up with conclusions about these two countries. Great activity, okay? And now this shows these kids working together with, there's a big graphic organizer that represents the group, etc. And using their tablets to get information, okay, fine. Now, I mean, what do you see here? You see, the students learning how to organize their thinking
to their best learning advantage and best thinking advantage. And that's what this kind of structure for these lessons does. And frankly, it's not hard to do. It means you need to shift, you need to ask more questions, you're not gonna tell the students things, you're gonna try to prompt them to come up with them themselves. You wanna get ideas out of their heads. Those students who told us what they needed to look for when they were thinking about energy sources, well, they knew all that. They had all that in their heads and they made a list of what they knew people were concerned about, about energy, and that drove the lesson. That guided the research that they did, okay? But these are students that are working in groups, but the groups are part of a class. And most teachers now are thinking, we, this classroom is a thinking classroom. And it doesn't mean this group thinks and this group thinks. Let's put it all together. So the students report the results from their groups to the other groups. Here is a group of girls, this is a school in Sydney, Australia, and they're, they're working on a bullying problem. And there's a little story about bullying in the classroom, and you're one of the students, and you know, you find out the person who's doing the bullying, and it's one of your friends. What are you gonna do? Okay, interesting. Well, these are different options, the consequences, and these students are reporting from their different groups, and then the class is going to really try to synthesize, try to come up with their own conclusions. Okay, great. So now this is actually from a school in Victoria, where they did the same thing, but they wrote them on the board. Okay, and this is a little girl in a school in the Bronx in New York. Same thing, she's reporting from her group, and it's a problem solving issue, and it's based on a story that they all read. Okay, now the, this school is a school in which the kid, all these kids come from poverty level families, and they're either Latinos or they're black kids. And most schools like that in the Bronx, you know, they just don't work, and the kids there's dope deals and what have you, but now they're really, these, this, these teachers are trying to pull them together and get them involved. Now, they read a story about uh, an old man, you know, who was part of the family, grandfather, they come there, they immigrated to the U.S. and they immigrate into New York. And the old man doesn't have a job, he needs a job, but he can't speak English, and the son can. So the son goes around, and he finds somebody who offers a job who says, I have a job for somebody who wants to pull the weeds out of my garden. Okay, so the boy sees it just as it's being posted. He goes in and he says, my grandfather can do that and he'll help you, okay? And he's a nice man and he talks to the man and the guy says, I'll hire him, bring him in. So he brings him in and the grandfather starts to work and the grandfather doesn't know a weed from a schmied and he pulls out all the flowers, okay? And it turns out that the boy lied to the man to get the grandfather a job. So that's the problem. What, you're the boy, what can you do to try to fix things, to make them better, okay? Now, I will tell you, it's interesting, that so they, that there's a book that they all read, and I think the book is here. And now this little girl worked in a group and I remember in that group, they, the, the solution they worked on was go and tell the man the truth. Tell him you lied about the grandfather, blah, 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 blah. And I remember these kids saying, yeah, we need to tell the truth. So they work on a graphic organizer, they think about the pros and cons, and this girl is explaining why that's not a good option. It's not a good solution. Why do you think it's not a good solution? Think for a minute. Why would that not be a good solution? Tell the man you lied. Confess. Now, I'm going to tell you, and you're all going to feel embarrassed. You're going to say, oh, of course. 
Because the problem is, how can we fix the garden? That's the problem. And confessing isn't going to fix the garden. Got it? That's what these kids were grappling with. And, and what they all realized was they need to start, when they do problem solving, they need to be very clear about what their objective is. What's the problem? Is the problem telling the truth? Is the problem, you know, fixing the garden? Is the problem making the man happy? Let's be clear about it, and then let's think about it. Very instructive and interesting and wonderful. I mean, I've got this little girl. She's a little girl from, a, you know, a from one of the worst parts of the Bronx. And she's got the courage to get up there for the whole class and explain all this. Fantastic. Okay. Now, if you could read it, it would say, this won't fix the garden. Okay. That's the book. Now, I want to show you a couple of others and then we'll end. These are kids doing the same thing. They're posting for the rest of the class to see. This is in Basque. These kids are learning about transportation. They're little kids. And they have to go on a field trip. What's the best way to get there? Walk, bicycle, automobile, bus, airplane? Cool and good one. And they decide, you can't see it, but they're going to go on the bus. And they did. Okay, now a couple more, three more slides. This is in a Palestinian refugee camp in Jordan on the Dead Sea, the, the Jordan side of the Dead Sea. And it's one of those camps that where people were making bombs about 10 years earlier. But I trained some. Uh, people in Amman, Jordan, Ooh. to be TBL trainers. And one of them went to this camp and worked with the teachers. So this teacher is doing a comparison and contrast with these students. They're all little girls, and they are all shy as can be because they know what's in store for girls and women in Arabic countries, okay? And yet, this, this teacher says, who would like to read their conclusion, it's a comparison and contrast, to the whole class? And nobody wanted to get up. And then this little girl, I was watching, and she was, she seemed very shy. She got up, you could see the way she's standing, and she read her conclusion. And now what did the teacher do? The teacher didn't say, that's a good conclusion. The teacher wrote her conclusion on the board. Okay, and I could see this little girl perk up. Okay, and I talked to some of them there, and I said, why, why did you, you know, why did you feel so good about that? And she said, when the teacher writes something on the board, it's really important. Okay, now, that's wonderful. Okay, so it isn't just thinking, it's self-esteem, it's, you know, lots of things. Now, this last one. In Chile, they don't include students with learning disabilities into regular classrooms. They pull them out, like they used to do here. And most teachers think they can't learn. These are autistic kids, so they have no language, they can't use language. And so it turns into babysitting, okay, whatever the age of these kids. But this teacher went to one of our workshops, and she thought, I'm going to try this with these kids. Maybe the structures will have meaning for them. Okay, now, the, in this class, I actually have somewhere pictures of a whole group. There are about 10 or 12 kids. Okay, and they have various kinds of problems you can see. Okay, but they, amazing to me. How many of you know what the Pacific War was in the 1890s? Anybody? The Pacific War was a war between Peru and Chile, okay, because Bolivia, which is a landlocked country, 
did a lot of mining. They did tin mining and copper mining, and they needed a route to get their, the copper and the tin to the sea into boats so they could send it around. So they had to go overland, and the land was claimed by both Chile and Peru. So they went to war. Great, great way to solve problems. You know, thousands of people got killed, okay? And, but Chile won the war. So Chile now makes the money that they charge the Bolivians to bring the ore. Okay. Now, you would think these are artistic kids who don't speak, they don't have language, okay, they're, you know, all over the place, but they know all about this war. The question is, how can they express what they know? And they express what they know in pictures. It's a remarkable thing. And these kids, in this war, the Peruvian Navy, which was made up of one ship, made of steel, sank the Chilean Navy, which was made up of one ship made of wood. Okay. So they were comparing and contrasting the Peruvian ship and the Chilean ship. And that's what's up here. And then the similarities, differences. Now the teacher sometimes wrote some words in there. That she wants them to get familiar. But for example, under the Peruvian ship, they put an image of a tortoise. And under the Chilean ship, they put an image of a hare. Now that's, you know, it's a metaphor. Of course. But what do they mean? Of course, they mean the Peruvian ship was faster than the Chilean ship, but they can't say that. And then the result, well, the, the Chilean ship sank and the Peruvian ship won the battle. Okay. <coughs> now, that's great. But for me, what and it actually brings tears to my eyes every time I see this, is this kid and this kid. I, I had been in that classroom about 10 times, and I never, ever saw these kids smiling. And look at the joy in having thought this through themselves. Okay, now I could be here all night and tell you a hundred other stories, but I'm not going to because what I want you to, I want this to sink in, and I want you to think about the different ingredients that I've shown you. The teacher helps the students to develop a strategy, they're going to use it, they're going to do practice, skillful thinking, but they're going to do it about something in the curriculum, and they're going to write down their ideas, they're going to do social thinking in their groups, talk together. Okay, so that this will all enrich them and enrich their understanding. And they're going to report to the class, they're going to listen to each other. Okay. And they're going to learn. And they're going to learn in deeper and richer ways about what's in the curriculum than they've ever learned before. They just memorize things. And for teachers, well, I'll tell you, many teachers say, I'll never teach that old way again. Thank you. Now, I need, I need to say one more thing. Because each one of you has about 10 questions you want to ask, right? Okay, but we don't have time for that. Okay, so there's two things. Okay, if you, you can find out from the leadership of this program what my email address is, and I'm happy to receive questions or comments from you, and I'll be glad to answer them. But what I'm hoping is that we can work out some arrangement where I can come back with some more of my team and we can actually do some of those workshops. We work on skill by skill, give you time to practice the skill. We work with you in your classrooms, okay? And then we'll do another workshop a couple of months later until you've really mastered 
all of these important skills. There are about a dozen of them that are important. And so we're hoping that we can work that all out. Okay. Now what that means is I have to remember how to get back to a story. <laughs> but I think I can do that. So again, thank you very much.